Geek Therapy Radio. Welcome back to the Geek Therapy Radio podcast. I am geeking out that you have joined me uh, for yet another podcast of of great geekiness. I hope it's great geekiness. Uh, the other day I mentioned, or the last podcast I mentioned, uh, a little bit of the my mentality behind the timestamps, but I didn't explain really why I do it, and I'll do it here briefly. Uh, in this podcast, by the way, coming up, we're going to talk about the curious tale of Thomas Fitzpatrick in the greatest bar bet of all time. I'm basically just going to read his Wikipedia page and make commentary on it because it's one of my, it, it is honestly one of my favorite stories of all time, but we'll get to that uh, in a second. Obviously, it'll be time stamped. So about time stamps, what spurred this on and why I'm so dedicated to doing my best, doing my due diligence to include time stamps is I listen to other podcasts, obviously. One of my favorite podcasters, uh, I like Mark Maron. Uh, he's one of the top podcasts in the world. Uh, Mark Maron, Adam Carolla, um, other just other big names. I'm not even a pimple on their butts. But one thing I noticed, despite me, I'll just use Mark Maron for an example. Despite me liking the Mark Maron's podcast, or WTF uh, podcast, I've noticed that what a lot of these big uh, podcasters do... And again, I'm not criticizing. What a wonderful problem to have. Uh, but they'll say, the guest today is Bill Gates or whatever. The guest today is is uh, Patrick Stewart, whatever. But they don't get to what I call the meat and potatoes on Geek Therapy Radio. They don't get to that usually for 15, 20, 30 minutes I, there was a uh, Adam Carolla, and I love Adam Carolla's podcast. There was a special guest that he had coming on, and I wanted to hear it. And it says uh, Adam Carolla show, spe- you know, guest is whoever. Part one. So I'm, oh, I'm thinking, oh wow, that's so. That's a really long interview. Great, and they spread it out into two episodes. That's cool. The guest wasn't even on part one. The guest came on on part two of that podcast an entirely separate episode and with um mark Marin, he'll he'll obviously you know he'll vamp and he'll talk about his cats and talk about what's going on in his life which is great but you never really know unless he's changed something recently but you never really know when he's going to get to what he talks what is what is um promised in the title whether it's a guest or a subject and again i'm not blaming them for this it's just the way the industry works so i figured while I can, and as for as long as I can, and and no matter how many sponsors I get or what happens, I'm always going to do my best to make it clear the timestamps of the guests that I have coming up or the meat and potatoes, so you have the freedom to skip and scrub around if you so choose to. If you don't want to hear 15 minutes of my preamble or 20 minutes of what's going on in my life or of any funny stories or any side notes or or rabbit trails you can just skip to right where i say in the title i'm going to talk about uh this the greatest bar bet of all time this thomas fitzpatrick story at x time whatever in the podcast you'll see it right there in the title and in the description I just want to give that, I always want to give that luxury or that option to my listeners. Obviously, I would love you to listen to the entire podcast front to, front to back. One of the things that happens when you subscribe to a podcast, I know because I subscribe to podcasts, is after a while, you're subscribed to the personality and the person. You're going to listen to Mark Marin's 25 minutes talking about his cat before he gets to the actual guest or meat and potatoes of the episode because you like Mark Marin. You may be at the point, um, at some point it may come to be that I am a voice of comfort in your life and you just want to check in with me. What am I talking about for the day? If I go off on a tangent about ballpoint pens or baseball caps or whatever, construction cranes that have nothing to do with what's in the title of the show. And because those rabbit trails exist, because we're just going to connect usually for a bit, for a few minutes uh, of each show. I'm going to put the timestamp for the meat potatoes of the title. I feel like 
I feel like I owe that to you, the listener. So that's that's why I do it. And I promise to you, I will continue to try my best to include the timestamps and be clear and and be transparent about uh, what I'm doing here and about what each show is about. So thank you so much for listening to Geek Therapy Radio again. And again, I'm saying this for for a lot of new listeners that might be coming off, you know, might be coming here from cross promotion on other bigger YouTubers channels or podcasters channels or shows or whatever. Oh, by the way, as I'm reminded here, and since there's a timestamp, doesn't really matter. I can talk about it. It's fun and it's neat, but it's also kind of sad. June, as of recording this podcast, the month I'm recording this podcast, it was supposed to be a pretty big month. Now, obviously, most of you listening know that I just did a, a video with the 8 guy, David Murray, exploring Houston. This month, around this time, this weekend or so, but definitely this month, I was supposed to help MC an event for Coast to Coast AM with George Nori here in Houston. I was supposed to go on stage in front of thousands of people and be a part of a panel and have a huge cross promotion, worldwide global cross promotion with Coast to Coast AM with George Nori. I've been li- I've had George Nori on the show uh, pre- previously. If you go past through past episodes, just uh, like search for George Nori, it'll be in there. I've had him on the show a couple of times. George Nori, friend of mine. I grew up listening to Coast to Coast AM, and despite my dad being in the media, in the ra- in the radio and TV business, he was uh, a radio reporter and a TV anchor for 30 years or whatever. My dad isn't really what got me into the business. My dad actually said, please don't get into broadcasting. It is not what it once was. The gravy train is over and all these warnings, which <laughs> duly noted pops. But the what got me into broadcasting and podcasting, but first, in, uh, but first broadcasting, having my own actual radio show, was that I grew up listening to Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. Art Bell, the legendary Art Bell. I would, I, I suppose it was middle school when I first heard uh, Coast to Coast AM, and it scared me so much most of the time that even in middle school I was tucked up under my sheets and pulling the sheets over my head. Ghost stories and alien abduction stories. I loved Coast to Coast AM, Mothman, Bigfoot. Oh, such it's still just a glorious show. So to be a part of Coast to Coast AM in any capacity of uh, for cross promotion, not just having George Norrie on my show, but the fact that Tom Danheiser, their producer, and uh, uh, um, George, on my behalf, asked me, approached me, hey, would you, we're coming to Houston, would you want to be a part of that? We would love for you to be a part of that uh, when we come to Houston. <sighs> Unfortunately, that has fallen through because of the pandemic. The show dates have to be canceled. Who knows when in the future I will be able to officially be a part of Coast to Coast AM uh, and Coast to Coast AM function. I have put my name. I've talked to Tom. I put my name in the hat uh, to as a fill in host. I said, hey, Tom, on the event that George is on vacation and the hundred of other backup uh, hosts are on vacation or it's like Christmas Eve sometime and you're you need somebody way on the back burners. I officially put my name in the hat for that. I'm sure you have a thousand people ahead of me and a thousand more people asking, but I'm just officially saying that it would be the thrill of my life to host Coast to Coast AM one night on a holiday when the least amount of people are listening. I grew up listening to Coast to Coast AM. It would be an absolute honor. So Tom said, yeah, naturally, yes, there are 100,000 people <laughs> that have asked to do that same thing. But we'll, we'll keep you keep you in mind. But, you know, no promises, which I said, I don't even need a promise. I just wanted you to officially know that I have officially put my name in the hat for consideration. If and when you need to call somebody from the bench or the bench of the bench or the bench, bench, bench of the bench. I would like to host Coast to Coast AM and do call-ins and talk about people's geeks, geek things and hobbies and different fascinating things that people are into. I think it would be amazing and would fit Coast to Coast perfectly. Anyways, let's move on to the curious tale, the meat potatoes, the curious tale, one of my favorite stories of all time, Thomas 
Fitzpatrick. And I'm just going to read his Wikipedia page and we'll discuss and go from there. This is seriously one of my favorites. Okay. Uh, Thomas Fitzpatrick, pilot. Thomas Edward Fitzpatrick, April 24, 1930 to September 14th, 2009, nicknamed Tommy Fitz, was an American pilot known for two intoxicated flights where he flew from New Jersey and landed on the streets of New York City. Yes, I'm reading off Wikipedia here, but I'm embellishing. <laughs> and it's hard not to. Flights. At approximately 3 a.m. on September 30th, 1956, Fitzpatrick, while intoxicated, this sounds like a Trailer Park Boys episode, while intoxicated, stole a single-engine plane from the Tedderboro School of Aeronautics at Tedderboro Airport in New Jersey and flew without lights or radio before landing on St. Nicholas Avenue near 191st Street in front of a New York City bar where earlier he had been drinking and made an intoxicated barroom bet that he could travel from New Jersey to New York City in 15 minutes. The New York Times called the flight a feat of aeronautics and a fine landing. For his illegal flight, he was fined $100 after the plane's owner refused to press charges. It gets better. On October 4th, 1958, just before 1 a.m., Fitzpatrick, again intoxicated, stole another plane from the same airfield and landed on Amsterdam and 187th Street in front of a Yeshiva University building after another bar patron disbelieved his first feat. For his second stolen flight, Judge John A. Mullen sentenced him to six months in prison, stating, had you been properly jolted then, it's possible this would not have occurred a second time. Fitzpatrick said, it's the lousy drink that caused him to pull the stunt. <laughs> Local resident Jim Clark believed that Fitzpatrick's goal was to land on the field of George Washington High School. Another resident, Sam Garcia, described how times have changed, stating... If it happened today, they would call him a terrorist and have locked him up and thrown away the key. Maybe, so maybe some of his personal life will, will shed a little light <laughs> on these tales. Uh, I swear this isn't an episode of Trailer Park Boys. It's not Ricky stealing an airplane. <clears throat> personal life. Fitzpatrick worked as a steam fitter with Local 638 of New York City for 51 years. He lied about his age in order to serve in World War II and join the U.S. Marine Corps fighting on the, Pacific, on the Pacific Theater. Fitzpatrick was honorably discharged after World War II. He then joined the U.S. Army and served during the Korean War, where he received a Purple Heart. Let's talk about the Purple Heart in a minute. Uh, for his service. He was a member of the Township of Washington Golden Seniors. Our Lady of Good Counsel Men... <laughs> Our Lady of Good Counsel Men's Group, VFW Post Number 6192 of Washington Township, and the China Marines Organization. Death. A resident of Washington Township, Bergen, Bergen County, New Jersey, Fitzpatrick died of cancer on September 14, 2009, at the age of 79. He is survived by his three sons, Thomas E. Jr., Daniel F. and Stephen P. Fitzpatrick, and his wife of 51 years, Helen Fratinardo Fitzpatrick. I wonder if I could look up one of his one of his uh, sons here, his three sons, Thomas, Daniel, and Steve. I wonder if I could look one of them up and interview them about their dad. We'll see. Legacy. Fitzpatrick has a mixed drink named after him for his feet. The drink is called <clears throat> the Late Night Flight. So at this point, I think it'd be fun. I know I mentioned Purple Heart earlier, and we will get to that. At this point, I think it would be fun to see what is in a late night flight. And maybe I'm not encouraging you to make one yourself if you are of legal age. I know that one day I will make one myself. So I did a little bit of clicking around, really, I just clicked on a link in, in Wikipedia and found the actual uh, ingredients 
to a late night flight. I need to zoom in here. My eyes are bad. Okay, late night flight. Half ounce of Kahlua, one and a half ounces of vodka, half ounce of Camboard, Chamboard. I, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that. C H A M B O R D. I'm sure all you mixologists know what I'm talking about. Uh, but a half ounce of that, five blackberries, one egg white, and a dash of simple syrup. I'll repeat it one more time. Half ounce of Kahlua, one and a half ounces of vodka, half ounce of Camboard, five blackberries, one egg white, and a dash of simple syrup. It sounds pretty yummy. I don't know. Have most of you had, uh, of legal age, had a drink that was made with uh, egg white? I hadn't had a drink that included egg white in the ingredients until I went to um, Peru. Oh, and I should look this up as long as we're going down rabbit trails. The, it was the uh, like the national drink of Peru. Uh, I'm going to type this into Google here. National drink of, not drunk, drink of Peru. Um, Pisco Sour. I don't know why I couldn't remember that off the top of my head. Pisco Sour. It's the first drink that I ever had that includes egg white. And I, and again, I am, I'm a novice when it comes to these things. It took me years and years to an, to an acquire a taste for beer. And I still haven't, I am not a wine aficionado. I don't prefer wine. And it's just because I'm ignorant about wine, I think. I, I just need to branch out and taste more wine. Uh, so with mixed drinks, it, it would kind of shock me the first time when I was drinking a Pisco sour, watching the bartender make it crack an egg in there, not the egg yolk, but the egg white. I didn't know that drinks had, had egg in them, but then again, drinks can have all sorts of things in them. So the late night flight in honor of Thomas, Thomas, of Thomas Fitzpatrick, the late night flight. I, that's just one of the best stories of all time. Of all time. Dude gets hammered, makes a bet with a random bar patron that he could land a freaking airplane in the middle of New York City, goes out and does it. And since he didn't post anything about it on Instagram, had to prove it again a couple years later to another guy who didn't believe him. <laughs> drunk again what a freaking legend and yet again just another reminder that i really 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 want to get my pilot's license it is a lifelong dream of mine to get my pilot's license not to get too sidetracked here but it costs a lot of money to get a pilot's license 10 12 grand easy and that's if you that's if you speed through it. That's if you really know what you're doing and get your 40 hours quickly. 40 hours is the minimum. By the way, it's not like you reach 40 hours of, of classroom and flight instruction in the air instruction. And then you get your pilot's license. It's up to whoever's training you, uh, up to their discretion, whether or not you've earned a pilot's license. If you get a pilot's license in exactly 40 hours, that's amazing. You can go as you can go 50 hours, 60 hours, 70 hours. You may never be deemed confident enough, even if you've spent twenty thousand dollars on lessons in, in flight time. The, the state, the country may never deem you competent enough to have earned your license, your pilot's license, your private pilot's license. But bare minimum, it's 40 hours. I what is it? Um, I'm not going to quote. I've talked about it in the past in the show. Is it 20 and 20, 20 classroom, 20 up in the air, or is it vice versa? Something like that. It's it's split up some sort of way, and it might differ by different flight schools. I don't know. It might differ by different jurisdictions. All I know is all total about 40 hours is what's required by the FAA to get a pilot's license, but it's not guaranteed. Regardless, I would love to get my pilot's license one day. Absolutely love to get it. Uh, it's one of my passions. I play. I played Flight Simulator for so long. And here's the thing. I asked when I've gone up for a Discovery flight or two. I've asked the instructor. I the first time I said, "Don't don't laugh at me," but I've been playing Microsoft Flight Simulator since like 1995. Would that help at all in flight school? And he just said, "Yes, absolutely." 
If you've been playing Flight Simulator for 20 years or whatever, that can save you thousands of dollars in flight school. I said, oh, really? I, I thought because, you know, nothing can replace the sensation of actually feeling the wind resistance in the yoke in your hands as you try to bank and turn and elevate and pitch up and yaw, whatever. You know, how you put your arm out of a moving car and the air forces your, your hand back. You can feel that in the flight controls if they're not power assisted. Anyways, I just thought that flight would be so different in the real world from a flight simulator that flight sim wouldn't amount to anything in the real world for real world real world uh, flight instruction and flight school he said here's the thing there's so much ground school though you will already be so f much farther ahead in terms of recognizing instruments and having the basic concepts of flight down and that's what a lot of flight school is that's what a lot of the book stuff is 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 the six packs and the gauges and understanding rotation speeds and stall speeds and all that you'll have the concepts down It'll, it, that means that it takes less time once you're actually up in the air. You have a preconceived notion of, of what it is and these facts and figures that you've learned all through the, your experience of Flight Simulator. So yes, playing Flight Simulator for decades will absolutely save you money in flight school. You will be that much further ahead and have that much more uh, competency, especially with the, with the mechanicals and the facts and figures. So, to all of you out there who play Flight Simulator, and I am waiting with bated breath for Flight Simulator 2020. Holy crap. I already told my boss that as soon as that game's released, I'm, I'm uh, requesting a vacation day. <laughs> and I told my wife that you, you're, I'm going to be up in the man cave playing Flight Simulator 2020 whenever it comes out in 2020. And we're already halfway through 2020, so hopefully it actually comes out for public release, not just beta. In testing uh, phases, but actually public release in 2020. I'm waiting, waiting with bated breath for that. So anybody who plays Flight Simulator and you're thinking about going to flight school, all that time wasn't wasted. According to actual flight schools who use flight simulators, by the way, they will come in handy and save you money, at least with the, the book part of, of the lessons, as with the, uh, the ground schooling. So that's a good thing to know. Okay, so I talked about briefly going on a rabbit trail in terms of the Purple Heart. And I thought there was a couple little neat things to mention uh, about the Purple Heart. So, I'm just going to go to this Wikipedia page. <clears throat> First, I'll just read what the Purple ha Purple Heart is given out for. And then at least one kind of an interesting little snippet. Uh about it, I thought. So, here's the criteria for being awarded a Purple Heart. A, any action against an enemy of the United States. I, sorry, I should have set this up. The Purple Heart, according to Wikipedia here, I'm going to read this little blurb. The Purple Heart is awarded in the name of the President of the United States to any member of the Armed Forces of the United States who, while serving under competent authority in any capacity with one of the U.S. Armed uh, Services after April 5th, 1917, has been wounded or killed. Specific examples of services which warrant the Purple Heart includes A. Any action against an enemy of the United States. B. Any action with an opposing armed force of a foreign country in which the armed forces of the United States are or have been engaged. C. While serving with friendly foreign forces engaged in an armed conflict against an opposing armed force in which the United States is not a belligerent party. D. As a result of any act of any such enemy or opposing armed forces. Or E. As a result of any act of any hostile foreign force. If you've been wounded under, wounded or died under any of those circumstances, you are awarded the Purple Heart. So the most interesting thing about the Purple Heart, to me anyways, and there's many interesting things. Obviously, I'm not going into the entire history of the Purple Heart right now. Um, the Purple Heart differs... And again, I'm going to read this blur from Wikipedia. The Purple Heart differs from most other decorations in that an individual is not recommended for the decoration. Rather, he or she is entitled to it upon meeting specific criteria. So, other decorations, valor and, and other decorations uh, that you are awarded, somebody has to recommend that that you get that honor on your behalf. The, the general, your, your, your sergeant, I don't know, who, whoever has to recommend 
and put your name in there saying, hey, Private Hamburger should get a Medal of Valor. With the Purple Heart, you're already entitled to it. You don't have to have a commander going up the, the ladder recommending that you get a Purple Heart. If you have been wounded in combat, you are entitled to a Purple Heart. That is a big differentiator from other decorations that a soldier can earn. You don't necessarily, you're not recommended for it. You have just, you're, you've already earned it. You've taken a bullet. You've taken an injury for, for your country. In the armed forces, you are entitled to the Purple Heart. And I just thought that was fascinating. The person depicted on the Purple Heart is a side profile of George Washington. Before it was called the Purple Heart, it was called the Badge of Military Merit. The Purple Heart was awarded to veterans who were wounded on or after April 15th, 1917. And believe me, suffice to say, there is an incredible amount of history around the Purple Heart and its predecessors that I can't begin to get into in this episode today. But, but, rest, but, but believe you me, it is voluminous and very interesting if you're into that sort of thing. And I know there's a lot of geeks about military history. I like to think of myself as a very novice, very novice amateur geek about military history. I tried to read The Art of War, Sun Tzu's Art of War. It's, well, it, to say it's strategic, if you're into strategery in the, in, the, in, in the strategies of war, it's very fascinating. I found that I wasn't as enthralled with it as I thought I would be. Now, people who read uh, The Art of War, Sun Tzu by Sun Tzu, they are not military colonels. They have no, uh, a lot of them have no interest in the military at all, but they use it in business and, and in life skills. There's a lot of good information in there that helps them in other areas of life, not necessarily specifically warfare or how to conduct warfare with an enemy, but it helps them conduct warfare with, with personal struggles, helps them conduct warfare with finances or the workplace or getting ahead in life or how to deal with situations. It's a very valuable book in that regard. And I just find that very fascinating. All right. So I think we'll wrap up here with the little DeLorean update. So, all right. Side note, every podcast isn't an hour long. I used to do, and I, I'm slowly ramping back up to doing a podcast a day. So five days a week, at least. Uh, doing a podcast that is four podcasts and then I make a podcast of the broadcast so either way five days a week you have five days of content uh, I'm it's been so busy at least for me personally during the the uh, pandemic that I've had to kind of put that pace on the back burner but I'm trying to do at least two or three podcasts per week uh, to let you know again not every single one of them is going to be an hour long I, I try to make them at least four 15 minutes long at least 20 minutes long thereabouts my my ideal goal was to keep it the length of an average american commute to or from work so 20 minutes or thereabouts if i get on a subject i'm particularly feisty about or just have a lot to say in a particular day sure it can go 45 minutes 50 minutes an hour over an hour i did a podcast the other day with uh clint from lgr the apit guy and colin from this does not compute we talked no, no actually what do we do? We did like two hours for that one. I did a podcast before that recently with uh, Colin from This Does Not Compute, where we talked for over three hours. So you're guaranteed at least at bare minimum, I'd say 15 to 20 minutes. I can't remember the last time I've done a podcast that short, but that's the bare minimum. You will never I will never upload a podcast that is less than I mean, at the very drastic end, 15 minutes. And again, I can't remember the last time I did a 15-minute freaking podcast. These things always wind up going long. I thought this podcast was only going to be 20 minutes, but here we are about to cross over the 30-minute 30, uh, 30 mark, depending on what ads they play at the beginning of the episode, which I don't know and I don't have any control over. To wrap, start wrapping things up here, got to be careful how I say things, a little DeLorean update. Last night, I replaced the hose. It fits on there just perfectly. I kept dabbling and kind of going back and forth on how much the hose cost 
because it looks like such a catastrophic, uh, expensive failure on the 8-Bit Guy video. Coolant hose, part number 100506. Price, $3.94. That's how much it cost me to replace that coolant hose. The funny thing is, in about, I don't know, 30 minutes, I, had to, I, took, I did one extra step to make things easier on myself, and a grand total, 30 minutes to replace that hose. Uh, the, I realized this yesterday because I had to stop by O'Reilly's to pick up coolant, to refill the coolant. Part of any sort of uh, coolant hose replacement job is that you're going to have to refill the coolant, and it's not as easy as just pouring the coolant in there, you're going to have to fill the whole system and get all the air bubbles out and bleed it so you get all the air bubbles out of the system so you don't have vapor lock anywhere or any pockets of air where the coolant's not flowing through the engine. So, in the DeLorean, I mentioned that there's a lot of plumbing in there because the radiator's way up front and the engine's way in the back. By far, the most expensive part of this replacement, or of this fix, and I didn't even think about it beforehand, was the coolant. The cheapest coolant I could find at O'Reilly's, just the generic stuff, the 50-50 antifreeze coolant, general purpose, all use coolant, was $10 per jug. And the DeLorean, at maximum capacity, takes about four gallons of coolant. Now, I'm not sure where I'm at with how much coolant I have in there, because again, with all that plumbing, I may have still had a couple gallons of coolant left in the pipes. So I didn't do an entire coolant flush, I'm just topping off the coolant. But thus far, I bought two jugs of coolant, two one gallon jugs of coolant, that was $20. So let's say I had to refill the entire coolant system with four gallons, that would be at least $40, AKA 10 times, literally 10 times as much as the actual hose. And this is coolant, Run-of-the-mill, generic, it's what you put in your car, it's what you put in any, most cars, it's general purpose, some call, some cool, uh, some cars require a very specific coolant, the pink coolant or the green coolant, but the coolant was the most, far and away, the most expensive part of this repair. Looks terrible in the video, simple repair, $3.94, and then the coolant was very expensive in comparison to the rest of it. And it's just run of the mill coolant. But just letting you know, I've replaced the hose. I have been documenting this. I have written the script to the video. I've realized something on YouTube when I do YouTube videos is I'm just, I've settled into the fact that for the most part, I'm just gonna be telling stories. That the way I write these scripts is telling a story and people are either going to like the story I'm telling and how I'm telling the story and find something interesting about it. I've learned, you get into a groove and I think anybody who uploads stuff, especially to YouTube, uh, finds a groove. And the groove I think I'm getting into is basically starting out each episode, each video that I upload, with no misconceptions or preconceptions about what the video is going to be. I started out with saying, just sit back and relax and enjoy the next few minutes. So, my most recent video that's up there right now is me upgrading my PC from a 4790K to a 3900X AMD processor. And I say in that video, just, hey, this isn't going to be an in-depth build guide. I am not set up to do that kind of thing. So, I say this is not going to be an in-depth build guide. We're just going to have fun upgrading my computer to 3900X, and here's my thoughts along the way. Maybe you'll learn something along the way. There's a few tips and advice along the way, but if you're looking for a nitty-gritty, multi-chapter, uh, clinical upgrade guide, that's not it. We're just going to have some fun here, so sit back and relax, and we'll just have some fun here. That's the way the, cool, uh, the, the coolant hose fix for the DeLorean is going to be as well. Yes, I'm going to show how I fix the problem how i replace the coolant hose but that's not the that's not really what the video is about i'm just going to tell a story along the way so really what it's going to amount to is here's how i fix the coolant that's going to be part of the video but i, I guarantee you the bulk of the video is just going to be 
neat drone shots of the DeLorean driving around, having a conversation about the DeLorean, having a conversation about classic cars, just trying to make it an enjoyable, relaxing, as informative as it's going to be type of discussion about classic cars. And it's kind of funny that, yes, you're going to learn how to replace the coolant hose on a DeLorean, but we're, we're just going to have a fun conversation and, and explore some things and talk about classic cars for several minutes. Just going to tell a story. And I think that's the groove I've I've gotten into with my YouTube uploads. If I don't just upload a podcast, you know, now and then, but my actual purpose built YouTube videos, it's just typing a script, going to tell you a story, enjoy the ride, whatever that story is. There'll be things to learn in there, but it's not going to be any sort of production with a 20 man team and camera operators and script writers and editors and and accounting departments and payrolls it's just gonna be me telling a story so if you want to and i guess that's kind of a segue to uh doing the plugs on the way out here if you want to subscribe to geek therapy radio on youtube it's just that type in geek therapy radio when you get to youtube and you'll find it i'll include a link in the podcast description here too uh but geek therapy radio works for All social media, not just YouTube. Can you consider YouTube social media? I don't know. But Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, just type in Geek Therapy Radio. Look for the red, white, and black color scheme. And that's me. I should point out right now, I've probably given a lot of free traffic to another podcast that's called GT Radio. I don't know if they call themselves Geek Therapy Radio, or maybe they just call them Geek Therapy whatever. But I didn't know about them when I created my show. So that's why now I've stipulated, hey, if you're typing in Geek Therapy Radio, if you see any other color that's not either red, black, or white, that's not me. If you see any green in there, it's not me. If it doesn't say Johnny Hamburger, it's not me. So when you type Geek Therapy Radio into into Google, and I think I'm the first thing that comes up on Google. I worked hard for that. Hopefully it's the first thing that comes up on Google for you. I've tested it on random computers, and it's the first thing that comes up. Either way, just type in Geek Therapy Radio or Geek Therapy Radio Podcast or something, Johnny Hamburger, into into Google, and it'll pop up. Look for the red, white, and black color scheme. That's me. Other than that, I think that's all I have to say. I have new cooling fans coming in for the DeLorean. I will let you know about that upgrade process, taking out the old, terrible radiator fans from the DeLorean and putting in the new modern ones that move twice as much air and take way less current than the old fans so let you know about that update process other than that thank you for listening to geek therapy radio if you want if you think what i'm doing here is you know neat or cool or you get any sort of enjoyment out of it tell your friends about it family friends that you might think uh like it uh share the links i don't often call people to do specifically call to action about sharing links and sharing with your family yes i do mention it once in a while but i'm a bad I'm a bad podcaster. I don't do enough of these call to actions deliberately to say, hey, you, the listening, if you like it, share it. I don't like to to browbeat you with this stuff. But yeah, if you'd like to help out with Geek Therapy Radio, tell a friend about it. Maybe share a link on your Facebook page if you if you want to, if you want to help out. Uh, The Patreon is there, too. At least 10% of whatever I make on Patreon, and it's not a lot at this point, but I appreciate my patrons. At least 10% goes to help those with mental health and mental health research. Um, but yeah, sharing Geek Therapy Radio with your friends would is just amazing to me. It's amazing to me to have you as a listener, and I very much appreciate it. This is a saturated, saturated media landscape, and you have a lot of choice. And I know I'm probably not the only podcast you listen to in that regard. Thank you for my international listeners. Tons of you listen internationally, and I am just blown away by that. Thank you so much for listening to Geek Therapy Radio. Know that you are worthy of love, both giving and receiving love. Yes, you, even if you currently have hatred in your heart. I need you to know that you're worthy of love. You are worthy of love and you are also worthy of your own self-confidence. And I think a good way to build that self-confidence and know that we're worthy of love is by embracing our geek thing because we are all geeks about something and that is wonderful and fabulous and fascinating and something to share with others. So embrace your geek thing. Thank you for listening to Geek Therapy Radio and I'll see you guys next time. 